Good to see you here this morning. Good to see the choir back and ready to go, right? Choir anthem this morning. And uh, to put your mind at ease, this shirt is not pink, Barb. It is coral. So thank you for noticing that. Uh, if you were here for Sunday school, you may have faintly heard our drum circle. Uh, we're practicing again. So if you're interested in that, please see Lynn Coors. Lynn's students will also be giving a piano recital this afternoon at 4 o'clock. So we encourage you to come and support that. This week, Tuesday, our jail ministry in the afternoon. Uh, Brianna's Hope in the evening, although I will not be able to be there because council meets this week at 5.30. Is that correct, Marvin? 5.30. Wednesday is online Bible study. And Thursday evening is the Unchurch at 6.15. Next Sunday, a week from today, we're going to continue with our movie. We started that last week. Very positive reception for that. Uh... We're going to be watching two episodes next week because they're rather shortish of The Chosen. So that'll be at 6.15 next Sunday. We'll talk more about that next week. Uh, but uh, it's a great series, and if you want to catch up, you can find series uh, Season 1, Episode 1 on YouTube. Lots of prayers and birthdays today. Happy birthday, Jacob Harker. Today... 16, I understand. Man, are you driving yet? No, no, that will be soon. This week, Fred Coors has a birthday. Happy birthday. And Calvin Kuhn has a birthday this week as well. Uh, prayers this week for the Adkins family. You may have seen that posted that Steve's brother Stan passed away. They're going to have a service in New Jersey at some point and then come back for another service here. They're not sure when that's going to be. Also for family and friends of Sandra Davis, who is Kristen Kuhn's mother. We pray also for those continuing with COVID. The Kopinskis are off of quarantine, I believe. I'm not sure about that. Deborah and Steve Adams still fighting with it. We need to add Francis Swift to our prayers. That's Sherry Harker's father who's been uh, put into hospice in Greenwood. And we continue to pray for those with cancer, including Jim Barnes, John, Wayne, Alana, Kathy, and my stepmother, Heidi, who was diagnosed with melanoma. Uh, they do believe it's fairly treatable. So are there any other announcements or prayer requests? I have an announcement. Uh, Manila Lions Clubs have a pork chop dinner on Friday, 5 to 7. Anyone that would like to come, we have, you can get a carry out or you can dine in. Manila Lions Club pork chop dinner Friday from 5 to 7, carry out or dine in. Golden Rule class will meet right after church in the basement. Golden Rule class will meet right after church in the basement. Is that related to the Christmas Bazaar project? No. no. Okay. That's Women's Guild. Women's Guild. Okay. Other announcements? All right. Hearing none, let us go ahead and lift up these uh, people and situations in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for bringing us here this day, a beautiful day to come worship you, to give you thanks and praise. We thank you for being able to come in freedom and without fear, and we lift up our brothers and sisters who are in danger, that you would give them strength and courage. We also lift up others who need you this day in mind, body, and spirit, praying for consolation for the Adkins family and for the Sandra Davis family, that you would be with them in their sorrow and grief and fill them with your loving presence. We pray for Francis Swift, who has entered into hospice, Lord. 
but that you would be with him and his family as he goes into this new phase of his life. Continue to be with those who have COVID, Lord, and bring healing to them, including the Kopinski family, for Steve and Deborah Adams. We lift up those suffering from cancer, especially Jim Barnes and John and Wayne and Alana and Kathy and Heidi, that you would bring them remission, healing, and hope. We continue to pray for healing in the lives of Charlie and for Tony and for Paul and Carolyn, for Al and for so many others, Lord, who turn their eyes to you. We thank you for another year of life for Jacob and for Fred and for Calvin. Bless them, O oh Lord, as their years increase and draw them ever closer to you. And we pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. This time I would invite you to spend a few moments of your own in silent prayer and reflection as we prepare to come into the presence of the living God. Amen. At this time, I would ask those who are able to please stand for our call to worship and remain standing for our opening hymn. Let us pray. Save us, O God, by your name and vindicate us by your might. Hear our prayer, O God, and give ear to the words of our mouths. You have delivered us from every trouble, and we seek your deliverance again this day as we come to you in worship and praise. Amen. And our opening hymn is on page 542. Seated. 
pattern to do this. It doesn't have any big words. <laughs> Our scripture this morning is from Old Testament is from Psalms 1. It doesn't say how long, I guess six verses. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do, whenever they do, prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff, and the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leaves, leads to destruction. And then from New Testament, James 3, verses 13, and into uh, chapter 4, verses 3, 7, and 8. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the hum humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure. Then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who, show, who sow in peace reap in harvest of righteousness. What causes fights and quarrels among you? They don't come from your desires that battle within, don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with the wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Here ends the reading of God's Word. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. Have you ever in your dreams or imagination or sometimes in those private moments you get for yourself wondered what it would be like to be famous, to be a celebrity, to have untold riches, to be able to buy anything you wanted, go anywhere, do anything, have anything, to have people wanting to be around you, always wanting a piece of your time, thinking that your opinion is important. I think all of us, all of us can say we've at least considered that. At some point, we see so much of it on TV and in the movies. It does come with a downside, of course, the loss of privacy. Just as it's kind of fun to think about having untold riches and fame, you also have to think of what it would be like not to be able to go to the grocery store or the movie theater or a restaurant without people mobbing you. Even as we think about those things, I wonder what it would be like to be related to someone famous, to have a famous mother or father or brother or sister or child. 
That's got to be hard, I would think. Think of the jealousy and the envy. They get all the attention. They get all the, all the money, all the fame. Everything comes to them. You're kind of sitting off here in the background. It's got to be kind of hard, I would imagine. For example, the famous actor Brad Pitt has a brother named Doug. Didn't know that. That's a great name when you think of it, by the way, Doug Pitt. <laughs> think about that for a second. But anyway, here's old Doug in the background. Brad's out front. He gets all the money, all the attention, all the women, all the fame. Don't you imagine Doug would be a little jealous? And then when people do pay attention to him, he's always got to be wondering if they're paying attention to him or because of his relation to Brad. Oh, tell us more about Brad. Is there any way I could meet him? Could you get me an autograph? It's hard to go through life as a Brad, I'll tell you. Well, that's kind of what's going on, I think, or did go on, with Jesus' family. We have to remember Jesus had a family. We tend to think of that mainly as Mary and Joseph and Jesus from the nativity story. But the Bible does tell us he had brothers and sisters. The sisters were unnamed. We don't know who they are. They didn't play probably any particular role in his ministry, and it's not unusual in a male-dominated society that they would not have been recognized. But we do know about his four brothers. Not so much about two of them, Simon and another one named Joseph, also called Joseph. But the other two, we do know because they became followers. They became believers. They became leaders in the church. Jude was one of his brothers. You may recognize that from that very short, almost page-long book in the New Testament. And then the other brother, whom we have been studying in our New Testament readings these past several weeks, is James. James, the brother of Jesus, the writer of the epistle. And a leader of the church in Jerusalem. And again, don't you imagine it would have been hard to be Jesus' brothers and sisters? Think of when they were kids growing up. Now, Jesus never did anything wrong. So whenever there was trouble, they're always pointing at you. Because Jesus couldn't possibly have done anything wrong. And then later in their uh, lives, when Jesus got older and began his ministry, he got all the attention, all the adulation. Everybody wanted to see him, the crowds, the fame. And here are these guys just kind of sitting in the background. There must have been some jealousy. We do know, for example, the Bible tells us that at one point his family, including his brothers, came to take him away because why? They thought he was crazy. Might have been some jealousy. So this is what James is going through. And add on top of all that... As we have said, the epistle of James itself has been criticized heavily over the years. A lot of the church, early church fathers, didn't think it belonged in the Bible because it's so different from the New Testament and the Gospels. The Gospels and the epistles talk about God and God's love and His grace and mercy. James talks about our relationship to God and what we should be doing. So we want to talk about our reading in James today and go through it and find out that it's not as unorthodox as we think it is. So we're going to be going through starting with chapter 4. And if you want to use your uh, bulletin insert to follow along, you can. We'll also put some slides up here. That's not the right one. That's James chapter 2. There we go. James chapter 4. Okay? He starts out, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? This is nothing unusual. Basically, all James is laying out here 
What causes fights and quarrels? What causes problems? What causes division? Is sin. Simply put, we are born as fleshly sinful creatures, inheritors of original sin from Adam and Eve. We follow down that road of fleshly desires, selfishly going our own way. And if nothing changes, we will die condemned that way, cut off and estranged from God. So this is nothing out of the ordinary. What causes fights and quarrels among you? It's that sin. It's that selfishness. It's that self-orientation. It is following the desires of the flesh. He goes on to answer his question. Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Basically, James is bringing up this idea of spiritual warfare that's quite common in the New Testament. We're born into the flesh, and we seek the flesh, and we seek selfish desires for ourselves. But when we come to faith in Jesus, when we're born again in the Spirit, now we are indwelt with the power of the Holy Spirit. And there is that constant battle, that spiritual warfare between the flesh and the Spirit. The flesh trying to pull us away from God, trying to get us to follow the world, the flesh, and the devil. The Spirit trying to pull us back toward God and to live in godliness. And there is this constant tension and battle going on. First of all, it goes on around us in an invisible sense that we cannot see. The forces of God are constantly at war with the forces of evil. But it also goes on inside of us. That constant tension, that battle between the flesh and the spirit. Paul writes about that in Ephesians 6, where he says, Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against what? The dark powers of this world. The evil powers. And then he goes on to describe this conflict more in Romans 7. Now this is Paul again, the great Paul, the evangelist, who talks about that struggle and falling into the flesh, where he says, I do not do the things I want to do. Instead, I do the things I do not want to do. These I keep on doing. And he goes so far as to call himself a wretched man. And that's where we are as well. We all of us face that conflict. The flesh trying to pull us one way, the spirit trying to pull us the other back toward God. And some of us face that battle every day. Verse, now we're still in one. No, verse two, verse two. He says, you want something. No, that's not the right verse. Go back. Did I get these messed up? All right. There we go. Well, go back another one. Yeah, never mind. Just pay attention to me. Don't look at the screen. <laughs> Ain't technology great. All right, verse 2. You want something and don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. Okay, you want something and don't get it, so you kill and covet. That seems kind of harsh, doesn't it? That we would be willing to kill for something just because we couldn't get it? Do you think you could do that? Just because you couldn't get something, do you think you could kill for it? That seems awful hard. But consider this. Look at the first murder in the Bible. Back in Genesis 4, Cain killed his brother Abel over what? Over a massive treasure of wealth? Over power, over fame? No. Jealousy, envy. That's all it was. They both presented sacrifices to God. God accepted Cain's sacrifice, or Abel's sacrifice. He did not accept Cain's. Cain got his nose cut off. And so he killed his own brother. David coveted Bathsheba. And even though he got her, he still killed. Killed her husband to cover up the crime. And look around us today. Turn on the news. Murders. 
shootings. Over what? Look at what people are getting killed over. Because someone didn't wear a mask or did wear a mask? Or someone was vaccinated or not vaccinated? Shootings and killings over the outcome of a football game? Murder over possession of a $100 lottery ticket. That is us. We want and we covet and we do not have, so we kill in order to get it. Now, we can go to this one. Why do we do that? What's the answer? You do not have because you do not ask. That seems to be a pretty simple solution. You do not have because you do not ask. So all we got to do is ask. Seems pretty simple. I'll ask God for what I want. God will give it to me. I will have no need to covet or kill because I'll have what I want. We know from personal experience that doesn't work. There are a lot of people that pray for money, for fame, for riches, for celebrity, and never get it. If that worked, all of us would be living in luxury homes and driving expensive cars. So there's something, a disconnect going on here, but James explains it there in verse 3. Because when you ask, you do not receive it because your motives are bad. You ask for the wrong reasons to use for your own pleasure. And again, this is in line with everything else we know in the New Testament. The difference between God's will and our will. See, too often we pray in our will. God, this is what I want, and this is how I want you to give it to me. And what we're trying to do is bend God to our will. And what God is trying to do by growing us in faith is move us from that selfish perspective to his perspective, to pray in God's will. Throughout the New Testament, we see Jesus saying, ask for anything in my name and I'll give it to you. Well, the key there is in my name. That's just another way of saying in accordance with God's will. Are you praying in accordance with God's will? We pray that every Sunday in the Lord's Prayer. Thy will be done. But do we truly mean it? Do we mean it if it involves our suffering, sorrow, deprivation, or grief? Are we willing to pray that God's will be done if God's will for us includes sickness? If God's will for us includes the loss of a loved one? We are always trying to bend God to our will, and there's nothing wrong with praying for healing or for certain things. What God is trying to do is move us in our faith to come to Him and see things from His perspective. God's will be done. No matter what that means or looks like for my life. How can we do that? How can we pray God's will be done if it involves the death of a child or the loss of a parent or suffering? James is going to explain that in verse 7. Verse 7. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. I want you to think especially about those first four words. Submit yourselves to God. They are the starting point of true faith. And they are also the hardest thing anyone will ever have to do in their lives. Because we don't want to submit. We like being in control. That's the fleshly part of it. That's the part of us that says, I can have it all. I can do it all. I can follow the devices and desires of my own heart. I can chase after all that stuff. Submit yourselves 
to God. God is calling us to do that. And that's more than just coming to church for an hour on Sunday and then living your life the way you want it Monday through Saturday. That's not submission to God. Submission is surrender. Submission is an understanding that God wants all of it. Not just part. He wants everything. Because He gave everything to us in His Son. Surrender, submission is coming to God on bended knee and saying, God, I've ruined my life. I've messed it up. It's a mess. I keep trying to run it myself. I keep making mistakes. It keeps running off the rails. I give it to you, all of it, totally. Here is my life. I give it back to you. You are the one that gave me life. I simply give it back to you. You are the potter. I am the clay. I surrender myself to you totally, wholly, completely. Take my life and use it in whatever way you see fit. That is submission to God. That's what God wants from us. That's what James is talking about. Not part not the hour on Sunday. All of it. Totally. All the time. And finally from verse 8. Come near to God and He will come near to you. Come near to God and He will come near to you. Well, I really must have messed these up. Just look at your bulletins. Too often, we have the wrong perspective of God. That is, we want God to come to us. God, you come to me. So we're looking for the burning bush, the thunder, the smoke, like we talked about last week. We often say, God, where are you? I don't feel close to you. I don't feel your presence. You seem far away. My prayers are bouncing off the ceiling. But God is where he's always been. He's not hard to find. He wants us to come to him. It makes me think of the story of the prodigal son. The prodigal son who went and spent all his money on wine, women, and song finally hit rock bottom. It says he came to his senses and returned to the Father. Father didn't chase after him. He returned to the Father. And where was the Father? Standing, waiting, arms open, where he always had been. And when he sees his son, he doesn't just stand there. He runs out and throws his arms around him. That's exactly the picture of our Heavenly Father as He waits for you to come back to Him in submission. To come to your senses and to realize that we owe Him all of ourselves. I used to think back when I was younger about being rich or famous fleeting thoughts, I suppose. I don't think about that stuff anymore. Haven't for years, quite honestly. I have everything I need or want. God has given me everything I need or want. He's given me a loving wife and a family and friends and a calling. I don't need anything else. I don't want anything else. Those times where I do think about the future or what it would be like or what it would be nice to have, I just want to be a better Christian. I want to have more faith. I want to pray the right things. I want people 
to be as excited about Jesus as I am. I want to be able to be together with others in the company of faithful believers and do nothing more than sit and talk and fellowship and learn more about this incredible God. Those are the things I want, I guess. I don't want all that other stuff. But you know what? I think if I could ever get there, I would be that something that's even rarer than a celebrity. More rare than a celebrity, more important and more special. And that would be to be someone who has committed himself wholly to God, who has submitted himself, mind, body, and spirit, to serve God and to live in true and growing faith. Amen. Our sermon hymn is on page 669. Show of hands, how many people still wish Beverly was here? Yeah, all right. I got an uphill climb today. All right. She is coming back October 10th. Pastor Randy has agreed to preach that Sunday uh, while I'm in Arkansas. And uh, Ms. Beverly will be back with you again. Uh, 
Anybody ever heard this expression before? I know some of the older people have. What about the kids? Have you ever made anybody say uncle? Oh man, I must be getting old. <laughs> It used to be when I was a kid, somebody bigger than you got you down on the ground and held you down. And to make you, before they let you up, they would say what? Cry uncle. Say uncle or cry uncle. And uncle was just another way of saying, I give up. So have you ever been in that situation? You have. Were you on the top or the bottom? You don't remember. Were you the one holding the other person down or were you down on the ground? You were the one underneath. It's not fun, is it? Oh, he was the one on top. Now it makes perfect sense. Now it makes total sense. So he's on top and you're on the bottom and he's saying something to the effect of uncle, right? Mercy. Mercy, all right. And so what did you do? You, you said because you wanted him to get off, right? Well, we used to say uncle back when we were kids. The point here is the person on top is trying to get the person on bottom to give up, to surrender before they let him up. So is it better to be the person on the bottom or the top? person on the top typically isn't real nice sometimes. But do we want to give up? Is it easy for us to surrender? Is it easy for us to give up? It is? Sometimes. Okay. When someone's on top of you and holding you down, it's easy to give up and surrender. Why is it hard for us to give up and surrender to Jesus then? Now, Jesus doesn't sit on top of us and hold us down or threaten us, but he wants the same thing. He wants us to surrender. He wants to give up. What does he want us to give up? Our lives. He wants us to give up that old life that we're born into, the fleshly life, the sinful life, the life where you want to be in control, where you say, God, this is my life. I'm going to do it my way. You just stand back and watch. He wants us to give that up. Why is that so hard to give up? Why do you think it's hard to give that up? Because it's fun being in control. Have you ever stayed up late at night past your bedtime? Wasn't that fun? Even though you knew it was past your bedtime and your parents... Wanted you, expected you to be asleep, you felt like, oh man, this is something. And you stayed up. That isn't what we call an act of defiance. It's you being in control. And it's fun to be in control. But too often when we're in control, we make mistakes and we do dumb things like staying up too late. So when Jesus says he wants us to submit to him, he wants us to surrender, what he's basically saying is, look, if you try to run your life, you're going to make mistakes. If you let me run it, I'll walk with you and guide you and lead you, and I can't make a mistake. So Jesus is calling you, he's calling me, he's calling all of us to surrender our lives to him and give them up. How much of our lives does he want us to give up? This much? No. That much? No. No. All of it. That's hard. It's hard. Some people cannot do that. So let's pray about that and ask Jesus for help. You ready? Say, Dear Jesus, we want to give our lives to you. Help us to do that. All of it. And all of us. Amen. Thank you guys.
You know, if I'd known about this family dynamic going on, we could have had a demonstration. <laughs> that would have been something. All right. I'm going to do something I never do for our success story. And don't take it the wrong way. But I'm ask, actually going to ask you to think about money and perhaps giving money or finding people who have money. The reason I say that is the bills are starting to come in for our television program uh, and we need money. And I'm not asking to pass the hat. What I'm asking you for is to prayerfully consider and find some rich friends. That's always helpful. Uh, I've gone out and I've looked and I've asked. And you know what? If you want to go out and do a program on racism or transgenderism or what have you, you can get all kinds of money for that. But if you want to do a show about the gospel and about bringing Jesus to people, they're not so interested. So I'm just planting that little seed today. Uh, bills are coming due. Uh, I just ask you to think about that. And if you know someone in your workplace or anywhere that might be interested in helping out with that, uh, please contact them. Please let me know. I appreciate your continuing, your continuing support for this effort. All right, our service now continues with our gathering prayer. I would ask all those who are able to please stand for that and remain standing as we express our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Let us pray. O Lord, whoever believes in the Son of God accepts your testimony. You have promised that those who believe in the name of the Son of God have eternal life. This gives us confidence that we can ask anything according to your will, and you will hear us. Amen. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one holy universal Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated.
Thank you, and it's good to have the choir back. Our service continues with our prayer on page 572. Let us pray. Lord, in all our decision-making as a church, as families, and as disciples of Christ, Lord, in the choices of what we do, what we see, the friendships we foster, and the ways we cultivate, cultivate them. Lord, in sifting through our dreams and ambitions, our career choices, our list of priorities, and our goals for ourselves and our families. Amen. Heavenly Father, we do come before you today knowing that we fall short in so many ways. We have sinned against you. We have sinned against our neighbor. We deserve only your present and eternal punishment. But you are the same God who always has mercy. You are slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. We come in the name of Jesus this day asking that you wash us again in his blood, putting our sins as far as the east is from the west and remembering them no more. Fill us with your spirit that we might live by that spirit and not the flesh. Help us in that battle, that internal spiritual warfare, Lord, to always listen to the spirit, even when tempted by the ways of the flesh. And help us, Lord, in our lives to give more of ourselves to you even if it's just a little even if it's just a little bit today and a little more tomorrow help us to give more ourselves to you to your kingdom to your glory to your service and to your people help us Lord to give more of ourselves to you because you gave all of yourself to us. And now we pray together the prayer that your son has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. A reminder that our collection plates are set up at both entrances. Uh, we very much appreciate you keeping up with your tithes and offerings. And thank you for your support of the work of this congregation and of the Church of God. At this time, I would ask those who are able to please stand for our closing prayer and remain standing for our closing hymn. Let us pray. Lord God, you have said that when we call on you and come to pray to you, you will listen to us. We will find you when we seek you with all our hearts. Help us to seek you with all our heart and soul and mind and teach us to pray for that which is pleasing to you. Amen. And our closing hymn is on page 561.
Hear the word of the Lord from 1 Peter chapter 5. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. And now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in all places. The Lord be with all of you, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Amen.